We'll talk about that after class. You hear a thing. I found the, the error, the mistake. Oh. <laughs> All right. So last time we sort of ended in the middle of uh, um, hearing. You know, we had talked about um, the vestibular system or the equilibrium system, the semicircular canals, the utricle, the saccule, but we had kind of stopped in the middle of the, of the cochlea. So if we just go back for a minute, um, the cochlea has a kind of complex three-dimensional shape. You know, it's like a snail shell, but instead of having room for one snail, it kind of has room for three. Um, because it has a, a, a vestibular duct, a tympanic duct, um, and then a, a cochlear duct in the middle. So we have sort of three tracks. But um, the uh, sound energy comes from the oval window, and then it, it winds its way up, and then it winds its way back down um, through these different ducts. Now, the, the reason for that, and where the magic of hearing happens, is right here in the middle. All along the uh, uh, cochlear duct on the inside is this fancy arrangement here called the organ of corti. So remember I said that the, the equilibrium system and the uh, hearing system all use hair cells, right? When the hairs on top of hair cells move in one direction, that cell is stimulated. When they move in another direction, it's inhibited. Well, just like we've seen with the equilibrium system, the hearing system works with those cells too. So here are the hair cells. Um, so we're zooming into this spot right here. And for the cochlea, the hair cells, the ends of them, are embedded or are in contact with this um, uh, structure here called the tectorial membrane. So remember, we're looking at just a piece of the, the organ of cordy. It actually is very long and spirals up along with the cochlear ducts. So what happens as sound energy passes through here and here on its way up and then on its way back out, it causes this membrane right here and right here to vibrate or shake. So as this membrane shakes, the base of this organ of cordy right here shakes. So this goes up and down. And the tectorial membrane stays relatively um, uh, constant. So these hair cells essentially bump in to the tectorial membrane as sound energy passes underneath. And that motion is how we detect sound. So if we look at hearing sort of from um, a, a distance, you know, we all remember that sound is waves of air, compression waves traveling through. So that's what we see here. Those sound waves enter the uh, external auditory hiatus. They transfer their energy to the tympanic membrane. So the movement, the shaking of the air becomes the shaking of the tympanic membrane here. That motion is transferred to the oval window by the um, uh, ossicles or the ear bones. That, so now we've got from tympanic membrane movement now we have movement in the, uh, at the oval window. So that causes this endolymph here to now move. So now that same sound energy from here has been translated into movement in this fluid here. So that energy travels up the spiral to the top and then back out of the spiral all the way back to the middle here at the round window. So that sound energy travels up and out but eventually it goes back out into the middle ear. Now, why is that important? Because it means that the cochlea doesn't ever have to get rid of this sound energy. You know, energy is, you, you can't create it and you can't destroy it, right? You can just move it around. Well, by having this second window, this round window, that sound energy goes back out into the middle ear and eventually back out into the world. So it doesn't heat anything up and it doesn't cause any uh, problems. All right, so the actual hearing occurs in this center part called the cochlear duct. And this motion of uh, endolymph causes this outermost membrane to wiggle or move, and that's detected as sound. So um, we have, an, and then that information is carried back to the brain through cranial nerve number eight, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve. All right. So if we look at that in an even simpler, you know, or the <laughs>
cochlear part of it in as simple as you can draw it. Here we have the oval window, here we have the round window. We've uncoiled the spiral, right? So now we just have this sort of straight duct. Well, as sound energy comes in here, it travels around and then back out the round window, but not without moving this basilar membrane uh, before it goes. So as like for 6,000 hertz, that's a, a frequency or a pitch, we'll see motion of the cochlear duct um, at this spot. Now for higher pitches, it's further or it's closer to the uh, oval window. For lower pitches, it's further out. So the location of activation in the cochlear duct is how we sense frequency or pitch. So this movement here um, is uh, sent, so we have an up and down movement at 6,000 hertz, and that information is forwarded then into the brain as um, uh, sound information. So it's all about um, sound energy moving through the cochlea causes the basilar membrane to move, and that basilar membrane movement causes the organ of corti to move and send a signal to the brain that sound has been um, heard. Sorry, I thought I had one more slide there. All right. So that's sort of hearing in a nutshell. Of all the senses, the, the physics or the mechanics of hearing are probably the most complicated. So the, the key things to know is that sound energy goes from tympanic membrane to oval window, and then from oval window into, uh, into cochlea. Right? And then it's in the cochlea that that sound energy is detected by the movement of this basilar membrane in that cochlear duct. So the cochlear duct is right here. Here's that basilar membrane that moves, and it causes movement up against this tectorial membrane. It sort of flops up against it, and those hair cells are bent, which then creates that signal for hearing. All right. So our first question of the day here. So go ahead and get logged in if you're not already. Quickly, though. So I'm going to end it for a second. All right, I'm ending that. All right, the malleus, incus, and stapes are what? All right, jump in there. Think, though. All right, last few people. Go ahead and get in there. All right. So these are the proper names of the ossicles or the ear bones. And we find the ear bones in the middle ear, not the inner ear. The inner ear is where the cochlea and um, semicircular canals are. So the uh, ossicles are found in the middle ear and they transmit vibrations from the eardrum to the oval window. That's their job. Now, why not just have the oval window where the tympanic membrane is? Well, these bones allow the middle ear to control the volume, so to speak, of the world. So if we're in a very loud environment, these bones can change the position of the tympanic membrane and the oval window to basically turn the volume down or even turn the volume up. In a very quiet, you know, situation, like, you know, in the woods at night, let's say, the ear can actually turn up its sensitivity, too, so that you can detect even quieter sounds at an even greater distance. So it's like volume control, these three bones. All right. Sensory receptors for balance are found in uh, which of those things?
All right, before our exam next week, be sure you review the special senses. Um, all right, so the sensory receptors for balance are found in the semicircular canals. So remember, the, the ear, the inner ear, we have these two big components that are not really connected. The, uh, the cochlea is the organ of hearing, and the semicircular canals and the utricle and saccule are the equilibrium system. So the semicircular canals give us information about rotation, so uh, how our body is moving in space. And um, the utricle and saccule give us information about acceleration and gravity. So the correct answer there is D, the semicircular canals. All right. On to the eye. And typically, people have um, heard more about the eye than about um, the, the sense of hearing from past classes, like health classes and stuff like that. So just a little anatomy review, and you'll note that I say you do need to know this anatomy. Why? Eye problems are actually relatively common in medicine. I'm not talking about big things like um, you know, blindness or detached retina or stuff like that. But um, uh, minor injuries to the eye, um, uh, minor infections of the eye are probably you know, some of the most common illnesses that people seek medical attention for. So this anatomy is important so we can describe things about the eye. All right. So we have a lateral canthus and a medial canthus. Canthus just means angle. So you have a lateral angle at one end of the, um, where the eyelids meet and then you have a medial one in the middle. Um, the uh, technical name for the eyelid is the palpebra. So we have two palpebra, a superior and an inferior. And then we have what's called the palpebral fissure. In other words, where the eyelid opens. So when you look at a person's eye, you're looking through the palpebral fissure to see the eyeball, right? Because um, when the eyes are closed, there is no palpebral fissure. So um, that's the palpebral fissure is where the eyelids open. Um, the, uh, the lacrimal caruncle, caruncle is just whole. If you look very carefully in the mirror at the uh, medial canthal side of your eye, you can usually identify a very tiny hole. That's where the tears drain, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. Um, the eyelashes, obviously, um, uh, form on the edge of the palpebrae. And then uh, the cornea is the clear part of the uh, outermost covering of the eye that covers the pupil and iris, which I have some better pictures of um, later. So medial and lateral canthus, palpebra, palpebral fissures, eyelashes. All right. So tears. The, um, the anterior part of the eye, which is the cornea, is perfectly clear. Therefore, it doesn't have any blood vessels, right? But it's living tissue. So how does, these, how does this clear part in front of the eye stay alive if it doesn't have blood vessels? Well, tears are the primary um, source of uh, nutrients and the, the primary way that oxygen is delivered and waste products are removed from that um, front part of the eye. So we need a tear system that's constantly producing tears and constantly draining tears. So there's a flow of tears across the front part of the eye that go from the upper outer side to the lower inner side. So uh, along the outside of the uh, orbit, just underneath um, the bone there, we have the lacrimal gland, which produces tears. Um, now, it has multiple ducts that empty um, just on the uh, lateral superior aspect of the inside of the eyelid. So they come out here. The tears travel all across the cornea here and across um, the, the conjunctiva, which is the, um, uh, uh, the white part of the eye that has blood vessels in it. And then they drain through um, the lacrimal puncta, um, or caruncle which is right here. The puncta is that little tiny hole. The caruncle is this whole sort of pinkish area. Um, so the tears drain out through what are called the lacrimal canaliculi. That just means tiny canal. Canaliculi is tiny canal. And then uh, those uh, canals drain into the lacrimal sac, 
which is found right up against the inside or the outside of the nose. And then that lacrimal sac then drains into the inferior meatus, so it drains into the nasal cavity. So when you cry, the reason your nose runs is because the tears are coming out of here, through this hole, down into here, and then down into your nose. So what's coming out of your nose is tears, because that's how the body drains it. Now, why doesn't our nose you know, run all the time then, if tears are made all the time? Um, the tears that are made here are usually absorbed by the mucosa of the nasal cavity before they actually drip out. But when you're crying, of course, it, it overwhelms that system and they just kind of drain out. All right. So if there's damage to the lacrimal gland, damage to the cornea will follow. So if there is infection or nerve damage or something like that that destroys tear production, if artificial tears are not used frequently and regularly, the cornea will die. So um, the, while we don't think very much about the tear system, it's actually critical to prevent the blindness that would result from having the cornea or that overlying clear part die. So um, they provide nutrients and oxygen and moisture. They help to wash debris out of the eye. So like if you've ever gotten something in your eye, which I'm sure we all have, you get a flood of tears, right? It's because the tears are trying to help you wash whatever that is out. Um, if you get uh, chemicals or other toxins in your eyes, again, tear production goes way up to try to dilute that um, damaging effect. So like acid in the eye, for example, or last year I got formalin in my eye, um, the tears help to uh, dilute that down. Um, they have some antibiotic properties as well as some uh, friction reducing properties. Tears are not just water. They have salt in them, they have some proteins in them that give them this antibiotic property and also make them a little more viscous than water. So they have a little oil-like texture to them that helps to keep everything lubricated. You know? So um, as the eye blinks, for example, it's sliding over these very slippery tears. All right, so the lacrimal system more important than you might think. All right, so then moving into the rest of the anatomy of the eye. The eye has sort of three layers. There's an outermost layer that's very tough and gives the eye its shape and its strength. Um, we call that the fibrous tunic. A tunic is just a covering. So the fibrous tunic is the sclera. That's the white part of the eye which continues around the whole back of the eyeball. You know, when we look at somebody's eye, all we are seeing is the front of it, right? But that white part actually continues all the way around the back of the eye, too. So this whole region right here is all sclera. And then the sclera in the front, um, in the area in front of the iris and the pupil, is crystal clear. And that area is the cornea. So uh, the fibrous tunic is the sclera and then the cornea. The corneal limbus is just a little canal that um, encircles the cornea. Um, not all that important, um, but they still have it labeled. All right, so then the middle layer of the eye is called the vascular tunic or vascular layer. Not surprisingly, this is where the blood vessels that supply the eye are found. Um, so around the, um, the back of the eye uh, is the choroid. And then in the front part of the eye, the vascular tunic has some important structures. So the ciliary body is right here. It's hard to tell in this picture, but it's actually round. It encircles the lens. Um, so we're seeing it in cross section. The ciliary body kind of extends up as the iris, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But the ciliary body holds the lens in place and changes the shape of the lens um, when necessary, like for accommodation. All right, so three layers. Oh, then the last layer, the innermost part of the eye is where the, the neural component is, so where the neurons are, where the sensory receptors of the eye are found. And that, of course, we call the retina, which we're going to talk more about later. So the retina is the innermost part of the eye. All right. So if we zoom in to this front part, which is you know, where all the excitement is, so to speak, because all of this is just filled with um, kind of a thick, gelatinous, clear material, 
But up here we have some different um, anatomy that's very important. All right, so if we look at the front part of the eye, we see that the eyeball is not, in fact, round. You know, round would be, you know, if you look at this, the back part is round, but the front part has this little extension. It's, it's not quite round at all. And that extension there, that's the cornea. So it doesn't follow the same uh, contour as the rest of the eye. It kind of sticks out to the front. And if you look at somebody's eye from the side, you can see this you know, in each other. You can see that the cornea sort of sticks out. Um, the cornea is, uh, is hollow. It's filled with fluid. So this part of the eye is clear. And this anterior chamber, so in front of the iris, but behind the cornea, we call that the anterior chamber. And it is filled with a substance called aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is very uh, thin and water-like. So it gets its name from being watery. Um, and it's uh, different than what fills the back part of the eye. So from the ciliary body on back is filled with vitreous humor, which is not water-like at all. It's like crystal clear <clears throat> gelatin, or jello, is basically what this vitreous humor is. <clears throat> so the aqueous humor fills this. And it's another one of those things, just like CSF, where it's constantly being made and constantly being reabsorbed. So aqueous humor is made by the ciliary body, right about here, and it flows. So it flows over the lens, through the iris, or I'm sorry, through the pupil, which is right here, and then from the pupil into the anterior chamber, and then it drains through this structure called the canal of Schlem, one of those great anatomy words canal of Schlem. Hard to forget. So do know what it does. The canal of Schlem drains aqueous humor that's produced at the ciliary body. What you'll learn in uh, subsequent classes is if there's a mismatch between production and reabsorption, that's what we call glaucoma. So glaucoma is an increase in the pressure of the, in this anterior <laughs> chamber because of some problem, usually with reabsorption of the aqueous humor. Because if it's being made but not being reabsorbed, more and more pressure will build up in this front part of the eye. And basically, it starts pushing everything backwards and can eventually cause blindness. But more on that in another class. All right. Um, so the flow of aqueous humor. Other important anatomy, Okay, here's the ciliary body here and here. There are these ligaments that attach to the lens. And the lens can either be pulled flat, or it can be uh, uh, relaxed into a sort of a ball shape. So the lens can change shape, as we'll talk more about later. All right, so this is the anterior chamber of the eye. Most of the refraction, in other words, most of the bending of light that um, brings things into focus actually takes place because of the shape of the cornea. So like if you have uh, myopia or um, uh, farsightedness or nearsightedness and you go in to have uh, you know, laser eye surgery to get that fixed, what they, what they modify is the shape of the cornea right here. So they'll either, uh, uh, they, they use lasers to reshape it through scarring essentially. Um, but it's this area that's reshaped. A lot of people think that the lens is being messed with. It's not. It's the cornea that's being messed with. Now, in um, cataracts, which older people get, that's the lens. Um, in some people, as they get older, the lens starts to get more and more cloudy. So when you look in your, their eyes, you see this kind of fuzzy green or fuzzy brown. That's the lens. Now, the, uh, there is a surgery to replace that lens with a, with a prosthetic or a fake one um, to fix uh, that problem. Cataracts. All right. So some other key anatomy points of the eye. Um, the, the, the most detailed part of our vision is in the center of our uh, visual field. So if you close one eye, so to speak, and you, you think of what's the center of what you can see, that's what we call the visual axis. So as light comes into the eye, the, the shortest path from cornea through the lens to the eye, that establishes the visual axis. And it's this area of the retina that is the most sensitive. And we give it a special name. 
So the fovea is the most sensitive area, and it's found in the center of what we call the macula, or the macula lutea, which is the, the sharpest area of vision. So most of our color vision and most of our precision vision is actually found very near this site of, of the visual axis of the eye. So it's the most sensitive part. Um, this is also another view of the three layers of the eye. So the, the retina, the choroid, and the sclera. Here's the cornea in the front, anterior chamber, iris, ciliary body, suspensory ligaments, lens. So we all know that the eye, that the pupil, can get um, smaller or larger as the iris changes sizes. So the iris, which is the colored part of the um, eyeball, um, it's made up of two separate muscles um, that work in opposition. So the inner part of the pupil is a circle. So it's a sphincter, right? We talked about sphincters, and when they contract, they close a hole, and when they relax, they open one. Well, the inner part is um, a sphincter, and the outer part is a radial muscle. In other words, like spokes on a bicycle tire, they all go in towards the center. So when this inner layer, this circular layer, constricts, the pupil gets smaller. When the radial layer constricts, the pupil gets bigger. So we have both motions we can do. So sympathetic stimulation or decreased light um, in the room the pupil gets bigger, like this. That's the radial dilator's job. And then increasing parasympathetic stimulation or increased light intensity and the iris gets bigger. In other words, the pupil gets smaller. And that's the internal sphincter contract. So um, uh, the two parts of the iris. Whoops. So a little bit about the optics of the eye, and some of this you know, will be review for some of you. Um, we have two, the eye needs to be able to do two things. It needs to be able to see things up close, but it also needs to be able to see things at a great distance. So you know, up to and including the horizon. You can't do that with the same kind of optics. You know, in other words, you, you can't have just one lens shape that accomplishes both of those tasks. So just like in your camera, you often have a, a telephoto mode and a regular mode. Well, this is the telephoto version for the eye, and this is the regular version. So when we're looking at things up close, we need to go from focal point to focal point. Um, so the, uh, the shape of the lens has to be a, a bit spherical. Okay. So when we're looking at something up close, the ciliary muscles are contracted which causes the lens to be somewhat round in shape. Now, the ciliary muscle, the anatomy here is a little complicated. So it actually does the opposite of what you'd think. You know, you'd think that if the ciliary muscle contracted, it would pull that lens flat. But that's not what happens. When the ciliary muscle contracts, it, its shape changes, which, is, which allows the lens to be more round. So, Close vision, muscle contracted, lens rounded. Now, when we're looking at things far away, we don't have a focal point that we need to bring. Like So focal point to focal point. Instead, we need to bring parallel light rays into focus on one point, like we do with a movie projector, for example. So this is more like a magnifying glass. Um, this is more like a movie projector, where you have to get all the, um, the lines in parallel. So here, the ciliary muscle relaxes, and that causes the lens to be flatter in shape. Um, so we get a nice, precise image on the back of the eye. Now, as people get older, this becomes harder and harder to do, because the rounding of the lens here comes from its own intrinsic elasticity and flexibility. As we get older, the lens tends to get stiff. It doesn't want to become round. It wants to stay flat. So what you'll find is that as people get older, they hold things further and further away, right, until their arms get too short and they have to get glasses. It's because this is not happening anymore. So their lens is not snapping back to that rounded shape, so they're sort of stuck in distant vision mode. So what happens is we give them glasses that allow for this focal point to focal point effect again. All right. 
So we call this accommodation. So when you're looking at something up close with great precision, that's accommodation as opposed to non-accommodation, which allows you to see things far away. All right. And then this is a review of elementary school science, right? The eye inverts top to bottom and left to right. This is due to the optics of the eye. So when, when the image comes in, it's flipped both top to bottom and left to right. Now, why don't we see the world upside down then? Because the brain um, flips it back over and puts it back in the correct orientation. There have been some really interesting studies that show um, if you give people glasses that uh, invert the image, either top to bottom or left to right, it takes only a couple of days for the brain to fix that. In other words, to put it back like normal. So when you first put these glasses on these people, obviously they're bumping into stuff and they can't navigate. But in just a couple of days, they're able to very skillfully navigate an environment again. Until they take the glasses off, and then you need another couple of days for the brain to go back to its original uh, optical uh, trickery. So the brain is accomplishing that. You know, the optics make everything backwards and the brain puts everything right. All right. So into the retina. So the retina is uh, the neurologic part of the eye, and it's where the photosensors are, so the, the actual light detectors. Um, so uh, at the very back of the eye, we have the optic nerve, you know, here, and the optic nerve is carrying information out of the eye um, towards the optic chiasm, which, um, so cranial nerve number two, right, the optic nerve um, is here. Coming in the center of the optic nerve is an artery and vein called the, um, the central artery, central vein of the retina. So it's going to supply the blood um, uh, to the, the retinal cells, which obviously are critical for its um, survival. All right. So the retina has two parts. The very back part is what's called the pigmented part of the retina. And the reason for that is it has lots of pigment. Usually it's, it's a version of, of melanin, but in other animals it can be a wide variety of pigments. And essentially, in our eye, it's there, uh, the pigmented layer is absorptive. In other words, when light passes through the retina, it kind of gets absorbed by this pigmented part. Why is that important? It keeps light from bouncing back through the retina again. So it's a one-shot deal. Light comes through the retina and is then absorbed in the pigmented part. So it gives us very accurate vision. But it doesn't give us very good night vision. In a lot of animals, your cats and dogs, cows, um, and many other animals, this pigmented part is actually reflective. So like when you look in your dog's eyes, you see this kind of greenish reflection sometimes. Cats, it's usually kind of this yellow-orange. It's because their pigmented part of the retina is reflective. So the light comes in, bounces off the back of the eye, and then goes back out. So they can see better in the dark, but they have this visual echo all the time. So their eyesight is not as, as crisp as ours is, but their night vision is much, much better. Is that where they get cataracts often? No, that's different. That's just the lens. All right, so pigmented part and neural part. All right. So when we look at the back of the eye, this is what your doctor is doing with that ophthalmoscope. When they look and it's really bright and you want to blink what they tell you not to, this is what they're looking at. They're looking at the um, arteries uh, and veins of the eye. Now what's cool about this image is it is the only place in the body that you can directly observe small arteries. So you know, in the skin you can't see arteries, right? But when we look in the eye, we can look at artery health. So one of the reasons that people look in your eyes is to see how healthy your arteries are. So like in a person with diabetes or a person with lots of atherosclerosis, you'll look here in the eye and you'll see gaps or missing parts um, as blood flow is being restricted by that disease process. But for today, here's the arteries coming in. They're coming out of the optic disc, which is right here. The optic disc is where um, the optic nerve enters the eye. Interestingly, the optic disc has no photoreceptors, so it creates a blind spot um, 
where uh, there, there's no light detectors in this region. Now, why don't we notice this empty spot in our vision? Because the left and right eyes, the blind spots are in different places. They're opposite each other. So the left eye covers the blind spot of the right, and the right eye covers the blind spot of the left with information so that we don't have gaps in our visual field. Over here is where that phobia is. That's that very um, uh, or, uh, accurate or detailed uh, part of vision um, where there are lots of cones. All right, so that's a picture of the retina. All right. One of the most interesting things in um, the animal kingdom is that in almost all animals' eyes, the retina points the wrong way. So you'd think if you were building an eye, you'd put the photosensors where the light is coming in, right? You know, just like you would for a camera. The light's coming in, you put the film there, and you get an image on the film. Well, for whatever reason, everybody's eyes in the animal kingdom are backwards. So the, uh, the light detecting part of the eye actually points towards the brain. So it points the wrong way. So how do we see then? Well, the non-light detecting parts of the retina are mostly clear. So the light actually passes through, like the vascular layer here, you can see the vessels, through these neurologic components of the retina. And then it's only at the very back of the eye where there's actual photo detection. So at the tips here are where the light is detected, even though the light is coming in from the front. So it's a little strange. Nobody knows exactly why this is the case. Like, why is the retina backwards? We don't know. But the bottom line is, it is. <clears throat> it just doesn't matter very much. All right, so here are the photoreceptors. There's rods and cones. We call them that because of the shape of their tips. So you can see this one's kind of cone-shaped, but these guys are rod-shaped. Rods give us... Uh, um, information about is light present or not. It doesn't give us any color information. Cones give us that red, green, blue, and all the combinations of those three things. So we have uh, cones that detect red, green, and blue, and by having those three color detectors, we can create all the different colors um, that we see. So the cones give us color vision and crisp vision, but only work under bright light you know, like in the room right now. Um, rods uh, only work or, or, or do their best work in low light conditions, like you'd find outside at night. All right, so photoreceptors here. Now then, there are multiple layers of neural cells in the retina. Processing of visual information actually begins in the retina. You know, a lot of times we think that the brain puts everything together. This is a case where that is not so. The information that goes out of the optic nerve has already been processed to some extent. Now, the occipital lobe is going to finish that job, but all of these layers of neurons uh, start to create what in the end will be our final visual picture of a scene. So um, the eye in the human is smart, you know, so it's already doing some like motion detection, for example. One of the reasons that our eyes are drawn to motion is right here in the retina, motion is, is focused on first. So some of these uh, layers of cells are going to account for that. All right. So then what comes out of the uh, photoreceptors through these other layers, um, and then here, these ganglion cells are going to actually send that information through the optic nerve and up to the brain. All right. So rods and cones are not evenly distributed in the eye. Um, the uh, macula lutea with the fovea in the middle, it has the highest density of cones of anywhere in the eye. So that center point of our vision, so like when you look at something, the very center of what you're looking at has the most detail, right? And I think we're kind of all familiar with that in our as we move our eyes around and things like that. Well, the reason for that is that center point is right here. So the fovea in the middle with the macula, high density of cones, so a high visual acuity. In other words, acuity is the ability to distinguish one thing from another, you know, so to see two dots, so to speak. As we move out from the fovea, 
we see a pretty sharp drop off in visual acuity down to sort of a basal level here. And then if we look at this band right here, the, the light tan is low density of rods, uh, dark tan is high density. So as we go towards the edges of the eye, we get more and more rods, but fewer and fewer cones. So the rods and cones are sort of opposite in the eye. You can um, sort of detect this phenomenon at, at when it's very low light, so like at night with the lights off. You can actually read something better out of the corner of your eye than you can out of the center of your eye. And that's it. It's an old military trick to see something that's very faint in the dark is to look at it out of the corner of your eye because the density of rods out there is much higher. So your ability to detect something at night is higher outside of your center of vision than in the middle of your center of vision. Um, it's also interesting, so I say in the slide, notice tonight how you can't see color in the dark. So when you turn the lights down low enough, you cease to be able to, to see color. Everything becomes shades of gray, right? Um, and that's because in, in low light conditions, the cones just don't work. So all you have to work with are the rods. <clears throat> A little about visual pathways, and this is a review because we talked about this in the brain chapter, that the, the way the left and right eye work together is a little less than intuitive, right? You know, you'd think that the left eye would send its information to the right side of the brain, right eye, left side of the brain. Not like that. Instead, it's visual fields that are sent left and right. So the left half of both eyes goes to the right side of the brain, and the right half of both eyes goes to the left side of the brain. So the way that I think of this is the, the brain and eyes work together to deal with the left side of the world and the right side of the world. So it doesn't really matter which eye it comes from. If it's on the left half of your world, it's going to be handled by the right side of the brain. If it's on the right half, it's going to be handled by the left side of the brain. Now, of course, that doesn't go on for very long because in order to deal with the real world, we can't deal with left and right, right? We have to deal with the whole thing. So the brain then puts those two pieces together into you know, our situational awareness. All right. But in certain kinds of strokes um, where one of these uh, visual paths is damaged, you can actually get bizarre phenomena like people ignoring the right half of the room. You know, they'll decorate one side of the room but not the other. So you can't really talk about the eye without talking a little bit about the, the most common eye disorders, which are refractive disorders. So any of you with glasses or contact lenses, you're on this page somewhere. All right, so in the unaided eye, in other words, for people who have 20-20 vision without the need for anything, we call that emetropia. And what that means is that the eye is just the right shape to have um, light fall very crisply right on the back of the retina. You know, this is evolution at its finest. This is exactly what the eye is supposed to do. Now, for a lot of people, that's not exactly true. The eye is not the perfect shape for ideal focus. So we have two different disorders. Myopia, which is the most common of the refractive disorders, um, which that's nearsighted. So you can see things that are near, but you can't see things that are far away. The problem here is that the eye is a little too long. So it's a little too long in the um, front and back dimension. So when we're looking at things that are far away, instead of the image falling on the retina, it's focused just a little in front of the retina. So by the time this light gets back here, it's blurry. So in order to correct that, we use a lens that spreads the light apart a little bit, a bit and now causes the um, uh, image to land on the retina where it's supposed to. In farsightedness or hyperopia, we have the opposite problem. Here, the eyeball is a little too short in the front and back dimension, and the retina or the image is focused behind the retina where it should be. So the image here is blurry. So what do we do? opposite kind of lens. Here we have a converging lens that's going to tighten that focus a little bit and bring that um, into focus right on the retina where it's supposed to be. 
Now, a modern correction to this is, like I said, laser eye surgery, where the cornea itself, its shape is modified so that a lens isn't necessary for um, the, uh, the focal point to fall right where it's supposed to. All right, we'll call that a day right there rather than do the questions. Okay, so I will see you all on Monday.